Thank you for that, uh, that flattering introduction. It's on occasions like this that I really wish my, uh, my children were here. Uh, uh, they'd be rolling their eyes, I guess, at that, at that introduction. But uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, the organizers of this conference, uh, Stephen Loosely, Peter Jennings, and, and, and uh, Ben, for putting together a, a, a very important conference. And it's truly my pleasure to be here uh, to talk about one of my, one of my favorite so topics to, to talk about. Uh, I'll begin with the, uh, the obligatory caveat. Uh, anything I'm, uh, I'm going to say, I'm speaking personally. Uh, not for uh, the U.S. Navy and certainly not for the U.S. government. Uh, my, my opinions and, and those of uh, mine alone. Um, now, I've been asked to uh, address trends in naval operations in the Asia-Pacific region. And to do that topic justice, uh, one really needs to do so with uh, a large dose of humility. Uh, as the saying goes, prediction is difficult, particularly about the future and uh, confident assertions are likely to be consistently wrong. Uh, still, there are some things that we can do to bound or to reduce the, the band of uncertainty when it comes to, to thinking about the future. So what I'd like to do is, is address the topic in, in three ways. First, to talk uh, briefly about the employment of naval forces across uh, the spectrum of, of conflict, which uh, as I will argue, is, is a constant. These are the, a set of naval missions that we, uh, we have to conduct now and will have to conduct into the future. Second, what I'd like to do is spend a little bit more time talking about trends in the strategic environment. That is, trends that will shape the resources available to navies, whether in Australia, the United States, uh, or elsewhere. We'll, we'll set the, the context uh, within which navies will operate in, in coming years. And then finally, and at greatest length, talk about trends in the operational environment. Uh, specifically, I'll talk about four sort of enduring competitions in, in, uh, in naval operations. Uh, but again, uh, in line with my, my earlier injunction for a need for humility, uh, I'll, I'll talk about some particular wild cards, some particular changes that we might see in those, in those trends in the out years. So let me start uh, first. Uh, by talking for a few minutes about the spectrum of missions for which uh, naval forces are used. And here I'll echo some of the things that the Chief of Navy uh, said before, before the break. It's a basic point, but nonetheless one that bears repeating, that naval forces are used across the spectrum of, of conflict. They're used for presence. They're used to shape the behavior of, of competitors. They're used to deter conflict and to reassure uh, allies and friends. And then you know, their, their ultima ratio, the ultimate reason for existing is, is fighting and winning wars at sea. Um, the point here is that these missions uh, require or, or, val or lead to a value for different attributes of naval forces. When it comes to presence mission, well, visibility is key. Being there is key. Combat capability is not insignificant, but it's clearly, it's clearly secondary to visibly being on scene. When it comes to shaping the behavior of, of competitors, capability is uh, more important, and specifically demonstrating that capability uh, is more important. Moving on to deterrence and reassurance, um, again, capability is more important still, whether it's adversaries who are being deterred, whether it's allies, friends who are being reassured, that, 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 uh, that bedrock of credible combat capability is, is extremely important. And then, of course, when it comes to war fighting, combat capability is dominant. Uh, and to, really to the extent that visibility, presence, actually can be a, a, a liability. Right? You don't want your adversary to know where you are. You may not want your adversary to know where you are. So I mention this for, for two, two reasons. Uh, first, the, the locus of missions that, that, a, that a country expects its navy to, to carry out uh, will really help shape the attributes of, of its forces. If you're more of a presence peacetime navy, you'll, you'll privilege certain attributes. If the ultima ratio of your, of your navy is wartime capability, you'll privilege other, other attributes. 
And second, I mention this because in recent decades, many navies, including the US Navy, um, have pursued a one size fits all force structure. That is, we've relied upon our most capable warships, our most uh, capable, most powerful warfighting assets to perform presence missions and to shape and to deter and to reassure. Um, however, in the future, as I'll discuss shortly, there's likely to be a, a sharpened trade-off between the demands of peacetime missions and the demands of wartime missions. In a world in which it's going to become easier to locate warships and having located them to attack them, uh, visibility is going to lead to greater, to greater vulnerability. And I think we'll need to ask whether a one-size-fits-all uh, force structure can, uh, can serve us as well in the future as it has in the past. The problem, of course, being both for the United States, for Australia, for others, whether we can actually, on the other hand, afford a true two-tiered structure. Well, so, so much for uh, the, the range of naval missions. Let me say a few words about trends in the security environment. These are long-term trends, and I think un unlikely, uh, unlikely to change. Uh, and these are the, the, the trends that will set the context for future, future naval forces. And, I, and there really are three. The first is a sharpening trade-off between guns and butter in advanced economies. I'll put it more clinically, a sharpened trade-off between national security spending and social spending. Now, threat perceptions may change this. It may change the willingness of political leaders and taxpayers in various countries to, uh, to expend more on defense. But over the long term, particularly as populations age in, in, advanced, uh, in advanced countries, there's going to be a growing call for increased social spending. And that will come at the expense of defense spending. I think we see that. Uh, quite clearly in, in the UK today, uh, in the run-up to the SDSR, where National Health Service has been ring-fenced, uh, defense spending has not. Um, so as a result, across the uh, mo more advanced economies, defense spending is coming and will continue to come under long-term pressure. Moreover, the, the differentials matter, right? So in countries like the UK, Australia, the United States, we're facing uh, those pressures now. now. In other economies, I'll say China, uh, China will face those pressures, but isn't facing them now. So for the short term, the, the Chinese Communist Party is, is able to invest more, much more, and to have guns and butter. So I think those differentials, those differentials matter. A second long-term trend has to do with the long-term growth in weapon systems costs. Now, in part, that's because we are able to buy more capability. Um, it's true. So platform for platform, uh, today's frigates, destroyers, cruisers are more capable than the, uh, than the combatants that they replace. But still, quantity matters. One ship can only be in one place at one time. Um, and as we'll get to later, this is another reason to, th to think about and why I think more navies are thinking about a high-low mix. Third long-term trend has to do with the growth in the cost of manpower. Again, there's an upside to it. The average soldier, sailor, airman uh, is more skilled than his or her predecessor, but they're also much more expensive. The, the apt contrast that I would draw is from uh, recent US, uh, US history where you, we could contrast the uh, Reagan defense buildup of the 1980s with the post 9-11 defense buildup. The Reagan defense buildup bought lots of hardware. The post 9-11 buildup was mainly consumed by manpower costs. So if anything, the long-term growth in platform costs, the long-term uh, growth in manpower costs, only multiply this squeeze uh, of, of, defense, of defense budgets. So what does that mean? As a result, it means that navies are likely to shrink. It'll be harder to maintain presence. 
And as a result, I think we're going to need to think through some novel ways of doing so. Um, it may also be increasingly challenging to deter and to reassure. And again, I think we need to think of novel ways of doing so. And, and then finally, in this world, each platform is likely to be more, relatively more valuable. It'll be more capable, but its loss will be felt even more. And as a result, I think we run the risk of, of risk aversion, of turning our fleets into a 21st century version uh, of, of, uh, of, a, of, a risk, of a German risk fleet from the early 20th century, which was meant to be risk, but never really was risk because it was too, it was too valuable, too worried about uh, it being lost. Well, third, let me move on to trends in the operational environment. So if we do face a world, smaller navies, more capable platforms, but fewer of them, What's the, what's, the, what's the future in which these, these platforms are likely to inhabit and the sailors that man them, what are, what are they like to, likely to face? Well, I'd like to talk about four sets of shifting balances. Offense versus defense, hider versus finder, networking versus counter-networking, and uh, in, in fleet design, the trade-off between the large and few versus small and many. Now, however, in line with my original injunction, uh, I would, as I go along, I want to apply uh, appropriate caveats. I'm not offering a prediction, let alone a, uh, a point prediction, but really trying to sketch out trends and then talk about how those trends may, may shift. So first, let's talk about offense versus defense. As Admiral Barrett uh, discussed, uh, at the tactical level at least, offense has traditionally been dominant at sea. And there are benefits to being the attacker. There are very clear benefits. Now this trend is likely to only grow sharper in the future, uh, particularly as the result of the growth and spread of uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance means and of precision strike systems. The, the premium for going first will, will only grow. As a result, naval combatants already face, but will continue to, to face even more in the future, an increasingly dangerous operational environment. Now, there are uh, potentially some wild cards that could change that. I'm thinking here of directed energy weapons uh, and railguns being two examples of potentially game-changing defensive technologies. Now, I say potentially uh, because Directed energy uh, for, for military purposes has been sort of, throughout my entire professional career, it's sort of been five years away. Just keep those five years, keep getting walked out into the future. Now I'm perfectly willing to admit that this may be different, that we may be at a, a point now where it really is only five, year, five years away, and if we have a meeting here in, uh, in 2020, I won't be saying it's five years away, I'll say it's here. Um, so it, we may be at a point where that changes, uh, where that's about to change. But design choices that navies make now and in the near future, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, naval power plants, will either lock them into or potentially lock them out of some of these game-changing uh, technologies. So I think this is an area where, where uh, short-term bets will either pay off or may actually just go, uh, uh, go, go awry. But it's at least possible to see uh, a future where the defense uh, is more dominant at sea than it has been in the past. Otherwise, uh, much, much, uh, much greater offensive, offensive dominance. Second competition, that between hider and finder. One of the reasons why the operational environment is becoming increasingly tough is a shift in the hider-finder balance. Traditionally, you know, it was hard to find ships at sea. That's why most, uh, uh, most major naval battles were conducted in close proximity to, to the coast. Um, however, modern sensor technology is shifting the balance increasingly towards the ability to find naval combatants. It's becoming increasingly easier to find ships at sea than in the past. Uh, and it is relatively easier to find ships than, than submarines. Now, not that these are uh, absolutes, right? It's not as if 
it, it, uh, it'll become uh, easy to, to locate warships, particularly warships that don't want to be found, uh, but it will be relatively, uh, relatively easier. And as a result, surface forces will face an increasingly challenging environment, um, particularly when one couples the, the uh, technology to find with the technology to strike. So ISR and precision, precision strike. Now, of course, modern navies are doing a number of things to reduce their ability to be found. Uh, for example, the large-scale incorporation of low observable features uh, in uh, surface ship design. But still, and this takes me back to the, to the first set of considerations about naval, naval missions, across many missions, across many parts of the spectrum of conflicts, many times you want to be seen. You need to be seen in order to demonstrate presence, in order to deter. It's hard to exert presence, to deter, to reassure, without being seen. Conversely, at other times, such as combat, you don't want to be seen. Um, and so this highlights the enduring relevance of deception and signature management. And here we should ask whether we, and I mean we to be inclusive, uh, of, of, of all the, uh, all the countries represented in, in this room and more, we should ask whether we've done all that we should do and all that we can do to hone these skills and maintain these skills, which are, after all, uh, perishable. Moving on to the third area of networking versus counter-networking. Networking has a long history in naval warfare, going back more than a century, uh, and it offers great advantages. It's probably not a coincidence that the two greatest exponents of network-centric warfare in the United States, Admiral uh, William Owens and Vice Admiral Arthur Zabrowski, well, were both admirals, were both naval officers. Uh, today, however, we're seeing a real explosion uh, in networking, and um, as, as Peter mentioned earlier, the, the benefits of, of networking for, for warfare. We're also witnessing the growing interdependence of different warfare domains. So networking not only among naval combatants and naval forces, but between naval forces and, and other types of forces. To take just one example, some of the most talked about anti-access threats that China poses come not from the People's Liberation Army Navy, but from the Second Artillery Corps. So thinking in terms of networks as opposed to platforms offers real promise and real benefits. But the power of networking uh, also creates its own vulnerabilities. Right? The very power of, of networking gives adversaries incentives to interrupt the links between sensors, deciders, and shooters. And this will be an ongoing competition and a, fe a feature of naval operations for the foreseeable future. As navies seek to balance the gains of networking against the potential vulnerabilities of, of networking. How it proceeds will go a long way to determine uh, the future naval operational environment. Here too, however, beyond this, this competition between networking and counter uh, networking, one can think of a, a couple of potential wild cards. Uh, one is, one would be, uh, truly autonomous systems. And what I, what I mean by a truly autonomous system is a weapon that combines sensors, deciders, and weapons all on one independent uh, platform. And here, I think the barriers are both technical, uh, but also, and maybe critically, more importantly, cultural. I think, I think uh, the know-how to develop autonomous systems is likely to spread faster than the systems themselves. Most of the barriers will be, will be cultural and, and perhaps legal and ethical. Uh, to, to their employment. Uh, another potential wild card uh, along these lines would be the development of, of truly secure or truly resi uh, resilient networks. Um, that could take things in a very different uh, direction. Finally, uh, a final, a final uh, competition or trade-off to talk about has to do with the trade-off between the large and few when it comes to naval combatants versus the small and many. Traditionally, uh, you get what you pay for when it comes to naval combatants, and you pay by the ton. More capability, more tons, more dollars. Now, networking may, and I'll say may, change this. Um, however, as I noted a few, uh, few minutes ago, those networks are likely to be vulnerable. 
gets back to this, this, this judgment call between rely, relying on the network versus relying on the platform. And traditionally, navies have, uh, have, have thought about mitigating risk uh, through, uh, through a high-low mix, although we've tended to do less of that in recent years than, than, in, the, in, than in the past. So I think that, that, uh, that trade-off between the large and few and the small and many is likely, is likely to continue, and different navies are going to place their bets different, uh, differently, and we'll see over time uh, who's, made the good, uh, who's made the good bet and who's made the bad bet. So in conclusion, um, sea power has always been important, uh, but we are in an era and in a region where it is of increasing importance. Moreover, we're in an era and in a region where sea power will be increasingly contested. Now, it's the nature of, of, of navies and the, the nature of naval design that decisions we make today or in the new, near future will go a long way to determine the shape of navies for decades to come. I spend most of my time these days uh, teaching the next generation of, of leaders. And one of, the, uh, one of the exercises I like to do with them is a little, little exercise uh, that puts them in the position of the US Navy's general board in 1930 and asks them to come up with a, uh, the, the future US Navy aircraft carrier fleet, which was supposed to uh, serve the Navy for the next 25 years, so until 1955. Uh, it's a relatively straightforward exercise, uh, and uh, except to, to really be able to, to, to design the future fleet for 1930, you have to know a lot more of, than just naval technology. You have to know what the strategic environment's going to look like. You need to know what, what, a, what an aircraft carrier is really supposed to do, and you have to make judgments about the, the growth of all sorts of other areas of technology, not, in, not including, uh, not the least, uh, naval aviation. So too today, as we think about a, a fleet that's going to last for decades, um, we have to make judgments about the strategic environment, about missions, and about all sorts of, uh, of, of technologies that may or may not pan out, uh, and may pan out sooner or later, if, if at all. So I end up where I started, with a plea for modesty. Um, some parts of the equation are pretty clear, the roles that navies perform. I think we can pretty confidently say that navies will continue to, to perform these missions in, in, in the future. Other trends uh, are reasonably clear if depressing. The long-term trends in the strategic environment, the, the sharpening trade-off between guns and butter. Other, uh, others feature greater uncertainty, the trends in the operational environment that I just talked about. Thus, we need flexibility and we need adaptability. We need the ability to take advantage of new capabilities, particularly new game, game changers if they come about, but also to respond to new threats. That requires sustained commitment over time, uh, and it involves resources. Sea power isn't cheap, but it's vitally important, uh, particularly for countries like Australia and, and the United States, which, which rely upon the sea in so many ways. But that investment goes beyond hardware. Right? It requires the development and maintenance of skills, including a warfighting mindset, as we've, as we've already uh, been uh, justifiably reminded, as well as technical skills, such as signature management and theater ASW. So with that, uh, having uh, posed lots of questions and maybe given a couple of tentative answers, I want to thank you for your attention, and I, I look forward to your, uh, to your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, and now over to Andrew. Thanks, Ben, and thanks very much, Tom. Now, the extraordinary thing about my talk and Tom's talk is that these talks were prepared on opposite sides of the world with no collusion whatsoever. Um, just bear that in mind when you see the remarkable parallels in the two talks. Um, I also need to note that Tom said that when you're talking about these topics, you need to do so with humility. Well, I, I fear that Tom has used up the reserve of humility for now, but uh, I'll see what I can do. Um, roles and challenges for Australia's future surface fleet. Those of you who give a few talks might look at that topic and think, 
Ah, yes, it's a general topic because he wasn't sure what he was going to talk about when he was first asked. Um, and you'd be right. H having a week more to think about it, if I got to set the title today, I think it would be how I stopped worrying about naval power and learned to love the Corvette. Uh, I'll come back to that later. But having a nice broad brush topic isn't a bad thing because it means I get to cover a good number of topics that I hope receive attention over the next couple of days. It's easy to focus on things like the type of ship for C5000 or the details of shipbuilding industry plans, um, but I'll try to keep the view at a higher level for a while yet. Let's start with maritime strategy. I think we should get one of those. <laughs> now, that's being deliberately provocative to an extent, um, and I'm well aware of the good work the Sea Power Centre does on maritime doctrine and the thinking that goes into developing both Australia's naval forces and indeed the rest of the ADF's force structure. But I still struggle to provide a pithy answer to the question, what's the Navy for? It's easy to respond with some things that are at a... Um, at least one level of abstraction um, down, such as protecting sea lines of communication or securing Australia's trade. But I think both of those are problematic for different reasons. To be fair, what the Navy is for is not an easy question for most countries to answer. I was taken down this line of thought by reading Paul Kennedy's The Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery. There was a time when Britannia truly ruled the waves and British maritime strategy was easy to formulate and easy to enunciate. The Royal Navy will overmatch the combat power of any two other nations combined. When you're the supreme world power, strategy really can be that easy. Over time, as Britain's circumstances and those of other nations changed, the strategy was modified to be the Royal Navy will overmatch the combat power of France and Germany combined. And as the days of British maritime domination passed behind us, British maritime strategy became much less ambitious, but also much less easy to describe in a sentence or two. Perhaps paradoxically, it's actually harder to explain the role of relatively smaller forces than it is for large ones. The United States is today's preeminent maritime power, and its mission statement is correspondingly pretty straightforward. The mission of the Navy is to maintain, train and equip combat-ready naval forces capable of winning wars, deterring aggression and maintaining freedom of the seas. And that's that. We can argue about the ability of a numerically declining force to do those things without qualification, but the intent is pretty clear. For us middle powers, it's much harder. We have no aspiration to be a global power, though we do want to do our bit for the international order. We want to be combat ready and we want our forces to be able to fight and win and we want to be able to deter aggression. But those last two can't be against all comers. As a result, we find ourselves having to formulate strategy in more nuanced ways. Now, a little bit of history is useful here. For a long time after World War II, we actually didn't have too much to worry about. We had to do some lifting in Vietnam and Korea, but that was very much in a support role in both instances. Then President Nixon made it easy for us by giving us what my colleague Mark Thompson has described as a get out of jail free card in the form of the Guam Doctrine. The result of that was Defence of Australia and that wasn't too challenging given the state of play of our near regional forces. We in fact came up with a local version of Britain's earlier global strategy by arguing that since intentions can change faster than capabilities, we will force structure to overmatch the forces of Southeast Asian countries. We didn't need a large number of surface warships or submarines to do that, so it was all good. With a relatively small fleet, we could maintain a capability edge over the neighbours and we didn't have to think too much about it. In a pretty secure region, or secure as far as the maritime dimension was concerned at any rate, and with low levels of capability everywhere we looked, capacity wasn't an issue, and a dozen surface combatants and half a dozen submarines was absolutely fine. I'm not sure that's the world we're in anymore. Thinking about it over the last few days, I came to um, suspect that the American rebalance to the Asia-Pacific in many ways was a quiet unwriting of the Guam Doctrine. There's certainly an implicit, and occasionally it becomes explicit, 
expectation from Washington that its allies and partners out in our part of the world ought to do more. That means we need to start thinking explicitly about the implications of the alliance for our force structuring. That's an interesting chain of thought to pursue, that the USN's mission statement is one that befits a global power, but it means that allies such as Australia that see a substantial role for themselves have got to be able to p participate in the top end of the winning wars and deterring aggression part of the mission. At last year's SIA conference in Fremantle, I gave a talk that unpicked, or at least as well as I could, what I saw of the roles for the future submarine. I ended up concluding that the capable, long-range future submarine that seems to be in the offing makes best sense in an alliance context. Now I'm starting to think that that's actually true for the Navy's top-end capabilities, and in fact the top-end capabilities of the ADF more broadly. That's got some pretty significant implications for the capability levels of the future fleet. Going up market like that means that we'll be going up the unit cost curve as well, and Tom's just described how that works. If we want to be able to take part in war fighting at a distance in hotly contested spaces, we'll need ships that are large enough to have high endurance, high survivability, and carry all of the defensive systems that make them survivable in that space. I'll come back to that point in a moment because I think that's a qualified statement. And we need enough offensive weapon systems to make them worth having a long inner fight. At the same time, we'll still need the local capability to do all of the constabulary work the Navy is tasked with and to be able to put together a task group if we need to do a Timor, again at short notice. The United States isn't as invested in Australia's local region as we are nor can we count on other security partners such as Japan. New Zealand is willing, but the force structure is weak. So we need to be able to do it alone in our own backyard if we need, if we need to, and we need to be able to do that, do all of those things within the budget that's available. That's starting to sound to me a bit like a two-tier navy, or as Tom described as a high loan high-low mix, one that has some serious combat power to provide in an alliance framework further afield while operating a lighter force closer to home. And I think I have a mission statement to go with that. The mission of the Royal Australian Navy is to raise, train and sustain combat-ready naval forces capable of helping our allies to win wars, deter aggression and maintain freedom of the seas while maintaining the independent capability to maintain order and support other ADF force elements in our local region. The words could be improved. It's not exactly going to fit on a bumper sticker, but you get the idea. Okay. That, that's actually a difficult trick to pull off, although I think the bones of it are actually already there in the Defence Capability Plan in terms of the future frigate and future submarine projects, both of which seem to be heading towards that upmarket um, alliance warfighting capability. And the offshore patrol vessels and the patrol boats in projects C1180 and 1179. If we're smart, that will give us exactly the Navy that I've just described. But I think there's a significant risk that the top end requirements will put so much stress on the resource bucket that the OPVs might well end up taking one for the team. Let me digress for a moment and talk about why I think we need to be careful in defining the requirements for the future frigates. I've written before that the best predictor for the future ADF force structure is the current one. And that's probably most true of Navy. I, I think Navy is, well, arguably the service most influenced by tradition and by its existing force structure. As far as the frigates go, my bets are on a requirement for the same number of frigates, just bigger and better, and thus more expensive. We're in the process of paying too much for three DDGs at the moment, and there's serious talk of frigates that are at least as large and even more capable, and that's not even the top end of the aspirations. I've, I've heard some pretty big numbers in terms of the, the size of the future frigates. If we want to be able to contribute meaningfully to an allied task group, that's probably what we need to be doing. That, that's where the trends are for high-end warfighting. But do we really need 11 of the Navy's major surface combatants at that level of capability? Or might it be better to acquire fewer top-end ships and put some more money into a larger fleet of smaller vessels that are nonetheless extremely useful in the activities that Navy will be doing at all of those times when major naval conflict isn't happening? 
Lots of money on big and very capable ships is very much an egg in baskets proposition. I'm not even convinced that the future prospects for large ships are all that bright. And Tom touched on some of these issues. But let, let me reprise something I wrote a few months ago, and I know that there are people in this room who disagree with that, and that, that's fine. But I, I think there's an elephant in the room, or at least something large and grey, and slow, and confined to manoeuvre on a two-dimensional surface. That's all in contrast to the growing number of systems designed to visit harm upon ships, which are small, fast, and able to manoeuvre in three dimensions. History shows us that the battle between shipborne defensive systems and attackers has waxed and waned over the decades, but my intuition, and it's really not much more than an intuition, is that the fundamentals make it increasingly hard for surface vessels to win the battle in the long run. Making ships larger and giving them more power and real estate for defensive weapons can't hurt, because more capability is always more capability. But they might still end up being on the wrong end of physics. And even if that's not right, the cost of effective defences has to be taken into account. Like all major military systems, there's been a steady real cost growth in surface combatants over the years. Depending on the ship type, the annual growth cost per tonne is around 2%. Okay, that's a real cost growth every year, 2%. The ships are also getting bigger for precisely the reasons I just mentioned. You need to give them the power and the real estate, which means that navies are getting a double whammy on unit costs. There's a real cost per tonne increase, and there's a real increase in the number of tonnes per vessel. The increasingly large number of increasingly expensive tonnes means that ships are rapidly growing in price and budgets aren't keeping up. Count the number of ships in the US Navy if you, do, if you doubt that proposition. A modern surface combatant is three times as expensive in real terms as its counterpart from 50 years ago. The effect of that trend is predictable and the fleets of the Western world have been in a steady decline numbers-wise for many years, while their tasks have not. These days the idea of being able to protect world trade, for example, is pretty fanciful. So I think that the reasoning that eight Anzacs should be replaced by eight top-end combatants should be tested pretty hard. We could actually end up in making a very big investment in a class of ships whose time is passing. It's possible that projecting hard maritime power into hotly contested areas in the future will be almost exclusively the job of drones and of submarines, although there are challenges in both of those areas as well. In any case, there'd be a substantial opportunity cost elsewhere in the naval or wider ADF force structure. Or history could repeat itself and the price tag of the top-end capable future frigate could see Navy face a trade-off between numbers and capability again. And I'll just remind you that last time around that gave us fitted for but not with. One of the problems, of course, is what to do instead. There's a lot to be said for bucking the trend of bigger and more powerfully armed warships and moving towards vessels that are designed for what I call less than World War III. That takes us back down the cost curve and allows, um, gives a chance to keep fleet numbers up. That's the sort of thinking, of course, that led the US Navy down the road of the littoral combat ship. A new type of surface combatant that's smaller, faster, cheaper and less manpower intensive than the large surface combatants makes a lot of sense. That idea is having some birthing pains, but I think it's a rational response to the budget challenges that modern navies face. As I said, I've come to love the Corvette, or at the very least, a less capable frigate. What we have to watch is the tendency to try to make the smaller ships as close to capable as the larger ones. If there's anything that's going to kill off the benefits of smaller and cheaper, its requ requirements creep. Adding more and more warfighting systems to the specifications will inevitably drive up the complexity and the price. But many ships, if you can afford to buy many ships, they can be in many different places at once. That makes them particularly useful constabulary, uh, for constabulary and border protection roles where presence in more places is a real bonus. But it also has application to warfighting roles like area ASW. I think the LCS has disappointed to an extent because of the lack of appreciation of the role of a, of a vessel as a low-end warfighter, able to operate safely against hostile but not terribly sophisticated defences. There are plenty of places around the world where that's the case, such as off the Horn of Africa, 
where the ability to deliver force from the sea while defending against lowish level threats has obvious applicability. And I think the deployment of, an LC of LCS to Singapore is a good one. There's lots of things a ship of that sort can do in the waters around there. It's true that you wouldn't want to sail an LCS against the anti-access area denial capabilities of a major power, but I'd argue that in days to come, you might not want to sail a very sophisticated and eye-wateringly expensive surface task group there either. It's time we had a hard think about exactly how and where we want our future surface vessels to operate. And we should give more thought to what the solution to C1180 looks like and to the overall force mix, both in terms of the numbers and the capabilities at each level. That's the force structuring side of the story, but that's only part of the challenges facing the Navy. Let me now turn to some of the other challenges that they'll have in implementing that strategy, or indeed any other strategy in the unlikely event that my visionary thinking isn't universally endorsed. It's possible. Let, let, let's return again to the USN mission statement. It starts with maintaining, training and equipping combat-ready naval forces. It pains me to say it, but that's already a stretch. The Royal Australian Navy's record on raising, training and sustaining, to use the local parlance, has been patchy at best over the past decade or even a bit more. Well, let, let, let me be a bit more egalitarian than that. It's not just Navy. As the Coles and Rizzo reviews showed, the DMO, ASC, the Finance Department and various other players all had a role in the level of underperformance we've experienced. But whoever was responsible, the amphibious fleet ran down to the point of unavailability a few years ago. In Navy's defence in that instance, they were trying to keep a couple of pretty old ships going and perhaps the results we saw weren't too surprising. I'll cut Navy some slack on helicopters as well. Navy was only one of the culprits and probably not the lead culprit in the Super Sea Sprite fiasco. And the Bravo Model Seahawks were orphans pretty much from day one. Keeping that fleet going was always going to become harder with time. But the submarines were new build to Australian specifications and the fleet ran down to inadequate levels both in the number of boats available and the crews available to man those, fews that were, those few boats that were running. In short, it hasn't been a pretty picture. To balance that, I should say that Navy has also managed to keep a frigate on station on the other side of the world for over a decade, which is no small feat. But tomorrow's Navy faces a potentially much bigger challenge. It's in the process of taking on two ALHDs and is going to take three D DDGs in the hopefully not too distant future. Those, both of those classes are more complex and demanding of skilled operation and support than their predecessors. And the LHDs will require Navy and the other services to develop doctrine and operating procedures for a capability we haven't had on that scale before. There's two dozen new helicopters on the way and Navy will have to relearn dipping sonar operations and rebuild its ASW capabilities. Then we're looking to add a larger number of new submarines, OPVs to replace patrol boats and complex new frigates on top of that and that's a daunting task by any measure. The good news is that it can be done. The RAAF is halfway through a similarly big overhaul of its force structure. A few months ago, it deployed halfway around the world with three aircraft types that weren't even in operational service five years ago, and with a new battle space management system that was delivered only after several false starts and a lot of project angst. But it hit the ground flying and rapidly established itself as a valuable operator in the air campaign, as well as being a contributor to the coalition's common goods through its tankers and AEW and C aircraft. It hasn't always been thus. Air Force has actually turned itself around from a fairly low baseline. Back in the 1990s, its F-111s weren't deployable into even a moderately dangerous situation when requested for a coalition task in Iraq. And the RAAF suffered a number of fatal accidents during the 1990s. Today, they can go to Iraq at short notice and be effective when they get there, and there are 10-year officers who have served their entire careers without a fatality occurring in the service thanks to a rigorous approach to airworthiness that's now applied. Navy faces a similar task, and it has its work cut out for it in a number of respects. Firstly, it has to be able to recruit, train, and keep individuals with the right skills. We know from Rizzo that engineers are hard to keep, and I think that's still the case. We know from Rowan Moffat's work that submarine crewing is challenging, and there's been some improvement there, but progress is slow. 
We know from Coles that diffuse accountability throughout the submarine sustainment enterprise and a lack of appreciation of what it takes to be a parent navy or in fact a parent country led to a predictably bad outcome. I think that's improved significantly, although I think it's still far from perfect. So there's lots to do. The government's commitment to extra resourcing to defence should help, provided it's applied to all of the enablers of capability, as well as to the new platforms that are coming along. I know this isn't news, and I know that Navy's hierarchy is seized with the challenge. We heard the Chief say as much this morning. I wish them the best of luck to go with their hard work and serious thinking. If they're to realise my post-post-Guam mission statement, they'll need to be at the top of their game. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I suspect you made many new friends uh, in the audience. Um, but thank you both for raising a lot of food for, for discussion. Um, we now have about half an hour um, for Q&A, uh, critique, um, so if you please raise your hand and um, identify yourself. Um, maybe we start uh, with Professor Dip. Uh, Paul Dib, the Australian National University. They were two very stimulating and uh, provocative uh, thoughts. Um, to both of you, would you care to respond to th that your argument about the vulnerability of major surface combatants, if taken to extremes, would lend support to at least one of our colleagues in this town who believes that all surface combatants are a waste of time. We shouldn't be proceeding down that path and we should put our money into not 12 submarines, but 18, 24, 36. The second question, relates to something that the Chief of Navy raised about us having global power and influence. And Tim, I do understand that, but there are limits to Australia's defence capacity and influence with a defence force of 57,000. And my bias, which is well known in this town, is that geography still matters. That's why Papua New Guinea will be always more important than Guinea-Bissau, and why a country that starts with I and ends with A called Indonesia will generally be more important than India and more important than a country that a friend of mine has just named called Italia that also starts with an I and ends with an A. Coming back to that in terms of the force structure that both of you have mentioned for allied operations, can I put it to you both, and this is a proposition, not an assertion, that in the event of high intensity conflict in Northeast Asia between China on the one hand and the United States and Japan on the other, while certainly we should have the capacity to make a contribution to allied warfighting capability, it will be limited. Some would say it would be a niche contribution, which has been our won't, but especially in uh, the Middle East. Something of, military, uh, of li limited military contribution that cannot be decisive to the outcome, but of crucial political significance. Coming back then, my final words to our geographical priorities in this white paper, the security and stability of Southeast Asia that screens our vulnerable northern approaches will also always be of great strategic significance. Couldn't a better contribution to that contingency in Northeast Asia where we could make a decisive outcome is something like the capacity with both surface and subsurface naval forces to blockade the Straits of Southeast Asia. Thank you. A lot of easy questions. Um, so, uh, Andrew, why don't you go first? Oh, thanks, Ben. Um, uh, l l let me make one comment. I, I, I warned about having eggs in baskets if we put our resources, all our resources into um, top-end platforms. If we put all, all our resources into submarines, um, that, that's an even smaller basket. And, you know, I if we were convinced we were going to fight World War III in the not-too-distant future, then yes, buy all the submarines we can. Um, no noting that the Germans tried that a couple of times and it didn't work. Um, <laughs> That's true. Yes. Uh, but, but, and, and in fact, it, it relates to the second part of your question as well, about Australia's ability to only make a small contribution to an alliance um, warfighting capability. Well, that's true, 
Um, but if you think about all of those things that aren't war, in particular, if we end up in World War III, we've, made, we've got it wrong. And one of the ways to avoid World War III is to have a group of strong, like-minded countries provide a unified front to deter aggression. The, the USN mission statement has two bits in it. One is to fight and win wars. The other is to deter aggression. Um, deterring aggression by having a bunch of like-minded countries that can work effectively together with top-end capabilities is actually an important part of that picture. Uh, blockades? Um, we, 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 we tried a blockade of a major Asian power once before. It didn't end well. Um, that would be my first caution. Um, but, but in terms of the, the model in which Australia has a... Um, you know, th there's a division of effort, and Australia looks after sea lines of communication near it, um, relatively close to us. Sure, it's a viable model. I'm not sure anyone's um, going to sign up to it because it, it's not necessarily... Um, as strong in the deterrence side of things. Paul, oh, thank you for uh, a couple of uh, you know, thought-provoking questions. Um, I guess first on, on, the, on whether surface combatants are a, are, are a waste of time. Um, you know, one, one thrust of my argument was that these are relative changes uh, in the in the threat environment. It's not an a, you know it's not absolute, right? So what what surface forces face, as with air forces and 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 to a lesser extent submarine forces, is increasing risk. Now, of course, that's not historically unprecedented. We've been there before. Uh, you know, navies during the Cold War objectively, uh, uh, you know, lived with much greater risk on a day-to-day on a -day basis for, for decades. Um, so that's one, one part of it. The other part of it is, Seems to me that, and I'm uh, I'm not averse to submarines. I actually I think they're quite uh, they're they're quite useful for a lot of missions, but they're not uh, they're not useful or they're not predominant for all missions. So presence. How would you do presence from solely from from underwater? Um, that's you know the, the sort of the antithesis. Uh, the presence is the antithesis of a submarine, right? Which is supposed to be stealthy. Same thing with deterrence and 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 reassurance. So it seems to me that, that you would, uh, a Navy that would go you know, completely uh, subsurface would, would lack the ability to carry out a, full, you know, a, a whole range of, of, naval, of naval missions. That's number one. On the, on the uh, RAN contribution in a future you know, high-end contingency and whether that would be a niche contribution, I guess my, my, my cute response is uh, it can be if you want it to be, but it doesn't have to be. If, if, you, if you aim for a niche contribution, you, you, can, you can have a niche contribution. But it seems to me that the, R, the RAN uh, offers, uh, offers a, a lot more, certainly in terms of capability, uh, albeit with limited capacity. And I think that the, the submarine force is part of that. I think ISR capabilities are part of that. Um, defensive capabilities and, and, and also strike capabilities. And even in a, as, uh, even in a, major, uh, a major conflict, sort of, it really is uh, scenario dependent. Um, if you're talking about a, a blockade scenario, a slot interdiction scenario, um, a medium a medium sized navy can play uh, can play a pretty uh, um, pretty important role, and particular and also to the extent that you take interoperability and alliance integration seriously, um, you can have outsized benefits from from a, from a, a medium sized contribution. Next question. Well, you are, uh, yes, in the back. Carl Claxton from SB. I'd just like uh, Andrew to talk about the implications of what he's saying for the LHDs. Uh, are the LHDs a high end or a low end, mm -hmm. or should they be geared to be a low end capability to do another Timor, in your words? How, how much uh, lethality should they have, or how much amphibiosity should they have, to use your own question? The, the LHDs are ships that pr um, potentially provide a prodigious level of capability. I think the answer to the question is the LHDs will provide what we decide they will provide. Um, I, 
it comes back to the well-known critic around town who wants lots of submarines, who also thinks that the LHDs are a waste of a, a large amount of space. Um, I think he's absolutely wrong about that. I think the ability to take a lot of stuff and to darken the sky with helicopters when you get to the other end and seize and hold entry points is actually a wonderful capability that I can imagine Australia using in a range of circumstances. For me, the question is, where up the level of opposition in terms of a, a, a lodgement do you want to be? Um, and that's, that's where the real capability question is about the amphibious capability more broadly. Um, the, the ability to do, to, to use the old language, a service protected evacuation where there are uh, low levels of violence is absolutely something that Australia will need to be able to do. And you can't guarantee to be able to use, you know, just sail, sail into a port and use harbour facilities to do that. So the LHDs bring a whole lot of positives. Um, how much higher up the ladder of, of opposition we want to go, I think, is the open question. Yeah, no, I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, I won't address specifically the LHDs, but the, to, the, to the operational challenge of, you know, of, of amphibious warfare in, in, a, in a high threat environment. I think we need to think about it not only in terms of the kind of the, the level of threat, but also we need to think about it temporarily, right? So even if, if, even if some of these capabilities wouldn't be uh, valuable at the outset of a, of a high-end contingency, it's very easy to see how they could be used further on uh, in such a contingency as the, as, a, as a threat is degraded. Um, as with many things, I think it just comes, comes to uh, professional judgments about how much you're going to invest in a, in a particular capability, the likelihood you're, you're, uh, you're willing to, or you're going to be able to use it and, and under what circumstances. And I think that's a, you know, that's a type, the same type of calculation that's going on within the U.S. military as well. I'll just add a footnote to that, that one of the um, things that I find frustrating in capability debates is that you find people occasionally um, arguing themselves in a position where they're trying to argue that more capability is not more capability. You know, the, the LHDs manifestly increase the capability of the ADF to do, to do stuff. And there's got to be, got to be a positive um, in there. Any other question? Brendan. Brendan Nicholson from the Australian newspaper. One of the things submarines can't do very effectively is carry a lot of aircraft. The, uh, Although it's been tried, yeah. It has no, been no, tried. No, 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 it's been tried. <laughs> it's, taken, it's taken an awful lot of very big submarines. They're probably the most potent weapon on the planet is uh, an aircraft carrier battle is such a force survivable? Could it survive in the sort of scenarios that you are thinking of in the future? And I, it's relevant to Australia because clearly we would be in some ways closely allied to, to the United States. If there were such an action, we'd be involved in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, look, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. And because, because of that, it's a difficult uh, question to answer concisely uh, because Survivability depends first, you know, on the on the scenario, kind of under what circum, you know, what conditions would you be employing aircraft carriers? Uh, also, very very much like my answer to the previous question, it, there's also a temporal dimension to it. Um, you know, might you want to employ aircraft carriers at the at the very beginning of a of a conflict when the you know when the threat is uh, before the threat's been uh, attrited and diminished? Maybe not. Um, so that's that's part of it uh, as well. Um, in doing so, would you uh, incur greater risk? Yes, but again, that's not historically unprecedented. You know, I'm, I'm the very very proud son of a World War II veteran. That was that was an era of great risk uh, when it came to carrier operations, when it came to amphibious operations, uh, all sorts of things. We we bore that risk. Uh, and so it's not inconceivable that in a, you know in a future circumstance we would we would be um, any less willing to to bear that bear that risk uh, you know, in in the future. Um, but what does it you know, what does it call for? It it calls for a certain a certain mindset, a certain innovative mindset, um, uh, attention to some of the things that uh, that I talked about in in, in my remarks. Uh, Thinking through defensive measures, deception, 
uh, signature management, all sorts of things like, like that. Um, so just as I wouldn't, I wouldn't count the uh, surface combatants out, I wouldn't count aircraft carriers out either, um, they're likely to, to play a, a prominent role in the future, albeit perhaps a, a different role than we're, uh, that we're used to uh, in the past or envisioning in the past. And do we have an Australian aircraft carrier? Um, I think the short, well, Ben's just asked me if we should have an Australian aircraft carrier. Um, I think the answer to that is no, because I can't imagine a circumstance in which we'd want to do an operation that, um, where an aircraft carrier would be necessary and we could deploy the number of forces independently um, to have a strategic effect. Um, I was going to make the comment um, in a follow-up to Brendan's question and, and Tom's remark that... Um, what, one of the things that's changed, well, many things have changed from 1945 to now, but t Tom said that the, the forces were prepared to take much higher levels of risk during World War II. They were also able to replace major platforms much more quickly than we can now. As these things have become much more complex and much more expensive, I think the United States could produce an aircraft carrier from, from keel to launch in under 12 months by 1945. Um, I think the build time these days would be four or five years minimum. So, so the idea of a war of attrition where you might take those levels of risk, I, I think are probably a thing of the past. If, if I could actually, two, two, uh, you know, two, two reclamas on this or two, two additions. Um, one, just to, to uh, echo uh, Andrew's point on, on industry. I mean, I think you know, uh, another feature of the security environment that we're entering it's likely to be increasingly important is, is the need for um, a, an industrial mobilization capability, whether it's uh, for munitions or for, uh, for major, major platforms. I mean, just on the munitions front, we saw not too many years ago uh, in the skies over Libya, um, the consequences of, of underinvesting in, in precision, uh, precision munitions and the difficulty of, of, of replenishing those, those stocks. Uh, it's not difficult to imagine if, if, that was, if that was a Libyan contingency. It's not difficult to imagine some of the problems that might occur in a, in a, in a larger scale uh, larger scale contingency. Um, so I think that's, a, that's an excellent point. The second, just on, on the aircraft carriers, I, I, I omitted sort of one of the most important parts of it, which is look in the end, and, and, and maybe I, I won't uh, Maybe I won't survive uh, uh, this this panel or, or getting out of the room. But but the, uh, the look the aircraft carrier is a truck. It's a vehicle that carries an air wing. And so in thinking about the future of the aircraft carrier, the one of the real key questions is what's the composition of its air wing? Uh, how long range? How many you know how many uh, aircraft? Whether they're manned or unmanned? What their capacity is? Uh, you know the aircraft carrier. It's it's a CV. It's a carrier vehicle. It's 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 meant to carry uh, carry aircraft. And so, if we're thinking about the future of the aircraft carrier, part of that discussion, a major part of that discussion, needs to be what's the composition of the airway. Peter. Thanks, Peter Jennings. So, I, I have two questions. Uh, I, I think I heard both the minister and the um, opposition spokesman say that they were committed to the continuous build of Australian naval vessels and I, th I think I heard both of them talk about spiral development and I, I wonder if that doesn't give us an opportunity to rethink um, the expectation of C5000 and some of the ancillary projects um, so that we don't have to think about um, a ship which is going to be eight of one thing and, and Andrew doesn't that then give us the capacity to not so much think about corvettes, but simply to think about C5000 vessel, which operates at different levels of capability and for different purposes. Is, is that not a more cost-effective way to think about the challenge? My second question is really to Tom, and I open also to Andrew, and that is to say, um, um, Tom, you, you're from the US. You, you hear a lot of discussion here about um, how increasingly maritime strategy is conceived of as being a part of a broader alliance strategy. So um, you're here among friends, mate. Um, tell us what you really think. What, what do you want? What does the United States think the Australian Navy should do? 
where, where is the priority from a US perspective for Australia? Mm -hmm. um, d two comments. Firstly, spiral development is a very fine thing. L locking in requirements now that you think are going to be um, still valid 30 years from now, as, as Tom said, you mentioned designing an aircraft carrier in 1930. Um, so spiral development is a great thing. I'm not, I'm not sure that what I was talking about was having um, 6,000 tonne ships that weren't very capable. If you're going to build a 6,000 tonne ship, you might as well make it a pretty capable ship because you're paying for all that space anyway. What I was talking about was a high-low mix where you have large you know, 6,000 tonne or even more ships at the top end, but down the down the lower end, the, the low part of the high-low mix, you have ships that are maybe 1,000, 1,500 tonnes. And sure, do spiral development within each of those classes, but I don't think you're going to... I, I, I think building a 6,000 tonne ship that does, does the sort of constabulary role that a 1,000 tonne ship can do is probably not a cost-effective way to do it. Well, the, the fat, fat ships are a bit different. So uh, thank you for that. I mean, I would say, um, as a uh, as a friend of Australia, but but uh, as an American, I would say um, I'd say th three things. Um, first is um, interoperability. Uh, I think I think interoperability, particularly interoperability with uh, with the U.S. Navy, U.S. U.S. forces, uh, is important, and it's important for for three reasons. And for, first. First and foremost, it's it's good for Australia. Uh, the RAN today benefits greatly from interoperability with with the U.S. Navy, and, and in particular, um, uh, access to uh, all sorts of uh, uh, sources of, of information. That benefits the RAN whether it's operating uh, as as part of an alliance with the United States, as part of a, a coalition of the willing, or, or whether it's operating unilaterally. That's an absolute good for, for Australia. It's also good for the U.S. It's good for the U.S. to, to have uh, allies that are, that are highly interoperable with the U.S. And, and it allows us, together, to do things uh, disproportionately better than we could alone. So this is back to, back to Paul's, Paul's earlier point. Is, look, even, even if one uh, deems it a niche capability, it offers Australia and the U.S. Uh, uh, more capability than either the U.S. would have on its own or, or Australia would have on its own. Uh, clearly understand sovereignty concerns, um, uh, and that's true of any that's true of any country. But I think I think the United States, Australia, and the U.S. Australia alliance benefit disproportionately from from interoperability. Uh, related to that, uh, a credible combat capability. Uh, it's it's not just interoperability for interoperability's sake, but it's inter, uh, interoperability to to achieve a credible combat capability. Uh, but third, uh, and and here I you know as in as in most things, I would agree with with Andrew. Um, also, the the constabulary uh, ca constabulary uh, capability, the ability to do things in a regional setting as well, I think, is something that that um, Americans respect and and. Uh, Americans expect ability to, to deal with things within this this region um, is 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 a positive as well. So those are the three things that I would uh, that I would highlight. What, what how would you define credible? Uh, yeah, I would I would say cred well a credibility as always is in the eye of the uh, the the, uh, the deterree. Uh, right, so it's 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 situational and it's uh, it's specific to you know a particular uh, particular competitor or particular adversary, uh, but that's you know that's real that's real combat capability, and uh, I would say you know the RAN has has certainly accumulated a track record over the years of, of having credible combat capability. I just think that needs to be uh, nurtured as we go forward. Neil. Neil Jones from the Australian Defence Association. Um, look, I obviously enjoyed both talks, um, but I'm worried about we, we keep missing two important factors. Um, first, the lessons of history, and secondly, uh, the lessons of, uh, of politics. You know, if you look at the Armadales, and you look at the Anzacs, and if you look at the 
um, the attempt to extend the life of the FFGs, which are never designed to be extended. We keep building down to a price and not up to a capability. And for those of you in the audience old enough to remember the height of Australia's amphibious uh, prowess at the time of the Fiji Q in 87, that Land Rover dangling from the dab out of a fishing boat at uh, Norfolk Island as it was transferred between an LCH and Trebrook. Um, we've come a long way with things like the LHDs um, that actually absorb the lessons of history um, and, and ships we have have a very long life. How do we put in a system where we stop building down to a price and up to a capability and I wouldn't like an answer to say, well, we need to decide what the capability is first. Because historically in Australia, we've continued with shipping to build down to a price and not up to a capability. Andy, you are... Well, I, I, I'm going to set a precedent here and say I absolutely agree with you, Neil. Um, <laughs> History has been made. Uh, <laughs> you saw it here first. Um, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and that's why I was saying before that if you want to build up to a capability with the future frigates, and that capability is, if we decide it's going to be a top-end capability to um, do highest-tier warfighting alongside the USN, then we need to bite the bullet and pay for that. But I don't think that we can pay to have it right across the surface combatant fleet. That, that was actually my entire point. If you want that high-end capability, don't compromise on it, but you will have, may have to compromise in the force structure if there's a resi uh, limited resource bucket. So the force structure is structured to the, to the price cap, not the individual platform capability. Just say, I mean, look, I think it's a, it's a general principle uh, of the era that we live in now and are likely to live, you know, inhabit in, the, in, in coming decades that uh, ships, other, you know, other major uh, military articles, you know, will be in service longer than expected. And they will be uh, asked to accommodate new capabilities that weren't envisioned when they were laid down. And those new capabilities will add weight and will inhabit space, and will create uh, create challenges, um, you know, weight and balance challenges going going forward. That that's that's the world we live in. Uh, we don't just scrap ships and, and build build brand new ones. So hence the need for flexibility. Now there are limits to, to that, right? There've been different attempts over the decades to build modular ships, you know, LCS being a good example of that. And I think by and large, the true modularity just doesn't doesn't work. Doesn't work once once you've actually laid down a laid down a ship. So you need you know you need a, a, a less less ambitious approach to, to flexibility. You need to have adaptability. And so again, it goes back to you buy, you buy ships by the the ton, you pay for them by the ton as well. Doug. Uh, Doug King from the Office of National Assessments. I'd like to drag the discussion back to the question of the future feasibility of defending surface ships against missiles and things. Uh, Tom was carefully humble and agnostic on whether the day would come in the next five years. Uh, Andrew said the physics are against you. Uh, but there's certainly an increased frequency of optimistic statements mm -hmm. being made. Uh, so there must be some arguments the other way. What are these arguments? And what weight do you attach to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um no, I, th I think there, you know, there is uh, increasing optimism, uh, both when it comes to ship, you know, shipborne directed energy uh, for defensive purposes, and also uh, rail guns uh, for for defensive purposes. Um, I think that's you know it's it's driven by a number of uh, R and D programs and and, and tests, um, and I, you know. Neither has reached operational deployment, but I would, you know, I'm, I am, I am, I am more optimistic than I would have been uh, five five years ago. Now, of course, 
both you know both defensive systems will requ require lots of power. So that's why I say um, decisions on on future surface combatants and their power plants uh, will lock you in or lock you out of of some of these defensive capabilities. So what one is likely to see, you know, uh, are some, I guess I would say maybe some expedient deployments of these, these capabilities. And you, know, you see that in the US Navy essentially with you know, test ships. Um, uh, and then over time, you're likely to see, if, again, if the technologies pay, pay off, then you're likely to see you know, more purpose-built purpose combatants. Uh, but again, I think it all really rises or falls based on the, the, the power plant. Um, now, again, if, if those technologies pay off or if one of them pays off, yeah, you, you, could, see, um, you could see a real shift in the offense-defense balance. You could see uh, ship self-defense becoming a lot easier. You could see uh, sea-based defense of you know, close uh, land-based uh, targets uh, more effective and certainly you go beyond just na you know, naval vessels. Uh, land-based deployments of, of, of these weapons where power is much less of a concern, where you can tie into the, tie into the grid, much more feasible. Um, you could actually see a, you know, a feasible, reliable defense against uh, ballistic and, and cruise missiles. And that would be, that would be a, big, a big thing. Um, I'm not dismissing that. I think if it, if it does occur, it would be a big development. But uh, the experience of my, you know, my uh, my career shows you know, just again to be to be uh, sort of humble and modest in, in, in these things coming about, and then be pleasantly surprised if they do actually pay off. Um, I, I think what Tom has described is possible, but it sounds awfully expensive too. And, and the thing is that making a ship more defendable, um, the the more the threat. Uh, multiplies both in terms of numbers and, and technologies. And remember that a, a ship 20 years from now might be defending itself against a swarm of hypersonic incoming missiles. Um, can you do it? Maybe. I, I'm perhaps a little less sanguine than Tom is, but um, let's say you can do it. The numbers, numbers will go down because the cost will go up. So, so that's a problem. But there's also a caveat on that. We're, we're talking about the absolute top end of, of war fighting there against a near peer, com near peer competitor. Improving the defences of ships, even if they don't solve the absolute World War III type problem, will still give, um, well, the United States Navy in particular, the ability to defeat, to defeat middle powers in other contingencies short of a war against a major power. So more capability is more capability. I'm conscious of the time. We have um, time for one more question. Thank you, Jacob Trager from CMAX Advisory. Um, my question goes back to the high-low, two-tiered two Navy. While the low-end capabilities may be good for some presence missions in constabulatory and anti-piracy areas, it seems to me that other presence missions require capability. And there's a big difference between sailing a couple of littoral combat ships into an area as opposed to an Aegis destroyer or a carrier battle group. In the Australian context, we might see that between a, a low-end patrol vessel versus a high-end frigate in the region, especially if other countries in the region, other regional powers, are projecting themselves more than has been the case in the recent past. So if we did go down a high-low, two-tiered Navy system, would we, could we then see the erosion of our ability to credibly deter aggression and could that see us lose influence and the ability to shape events in the Australian context in the region, but for the United States, possibly globally, because you don't have the same level of capability to put where you need it, when you need it? Um, th thanks, Jacob. Um, look, t top end ships go down the task list much more effectively than um, low end ships go up the task list. No question about it. If you had the resources, um, you would have every fleet, uh, every ship in the fleet at the very highest level of capability. If money was no object, that's what you'd do. But money is an object. So you, there, there will be a compromise. You, you won't have 7,000 tonne you know, rail gun 
directed energy fitted frigates out there doing border protection duties. Well, if you do, it will be a, a ridiculously expensive way to do it. So is it possible that one of those one of those smaller ships will run into a higher end ship that will cause it a world of hurt? Yes. Um, is it something that would cause you to restructure the Navy entirely towards the top end? No. I mean, the, the, the logic of forward presence and, and deterrence and reassurance, I mean, historically has been not that the forces on scene uh, were going to fight and win the war for you, uh, but they were going to trigger, trigger a, a response uh, that the party that started the war would, would regret, right? So the U.S., uh, you know, in, in the 1920s, 1930s, had the, uh, you know, the Asiatic uh, fleet, which was essentially kind of second, second tier uh, ships. They, well, they weren't there to, to win the war on their own. They were there that, you know, if, if attacked, you'd have a response. Same thing for the Royal Navy, you know, historically. Uh, you didn't send capital ships out to do, to do presents. You used smaller combatants. Frigates uh, to, uh, to to show the flag, uh, and if they were attacked, then there'd be bad, bad consequences for that for that action. We've gotten out of that habit, and again, it's it's uh, we've gotten out of the habit of, of accepting uh, a, a lot of risk on a on a day to day basis. I think we're we're going to have to get back into that habit. Unfortunately, we have uh, run out of time. Um, Thank you both so much for a very stimulating presentation and thanks everyone in the audience for participating. Um, we now, lunch is served outside. Um, please be back uh, by uh, 1400 and can I please ask you to join me in thanking our both, uh, both our panelists. <laughs>